We're going to start off with an introduction to diffusion weighted imaging and DTI, and then we'll show you our implementation and uh, and uh, and how to make it work with uh, with your resting state or functional to connect it to functional connectivity too. All right, um, we have logos as usual. This logo here is, uh, is the newer one. This one was actually designed by Delia Chen. So she did a really nice job there. This is Gang Chen's daughter. She's our, she's our artist here. So, all right, let's, these are some of the topics we'll cover. Okay, so obviously DTI is a kind of MRI imaging. Uh, we're looking at diffusion in the water. Uh, in general, water will just diffuse, diffuse randomly. Um, uh, but we're going, to, we're going to describe this diffusion in the form of a tensor. And this tensor has uh, this uh, kind of matrix. It's actually made out of, uh, it's a symmetric matrix. And it's got x, y, z components, diffusion in the x, the y, and z along the diagonals. And then combinations of x and y uh, uh, on the off diagonals. And we use it in MRI for looking at white matter, usually. Okay, so um, so generally, so if you have a, a cup of tea, uh, the tea sits in the water and it diffuses in all directions roughly equally. It doesn't have any structure. But if we put straws or something in it, like that that has a structure, diffusion will happen in, 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 uh, in a particular direction. And we're going to take advantage of that with our MRI signal. Usually, we'll, we'll, we will assign, we will calculate one direction for an MRI signal with diffusion tensor imaging, but we can look at more directions if we're doing something like Hardy. This requires a lot more acquisitions. Um, uh, and we can have multiple directions at once. Here's our diffusion tensor matrix again. We can solve this diffusion tensor to give us, uh, uh, we can get the eigenvectors, the three primary eigenvectors from that and the three eigenvalues from it. And those will give us the directions of those vectors. Geometrically, this is an, an ellipsoid surface. And that's one way to visualize uh, diffusion tensor images. Okay, this is showing that it's, it's uh, an upper symmetric uh, matrix here. Okay, so in DTI, what are the things that we look at? We have a few different uh, measurements that are that are useful. We have the uh, first eigenvalue. This is the size of the primary direction of the uh, of the eigenvector. So it's going the, the water in the brain is going in a particular direction at that voxel with with this, with, this, a, with this eigenvalue size. So if you have a larger eigenvalue, it will go more in that direction than a smaller eigenvalue. Uh, the eigenvector is the direction of that, of that flow. Uh, we can also look at the fractional anisotropy. How different are the directions from each other? So we will take the difference among all the eigenvalues and see how much they are different from each other. If they're not different at all, then we have a sphere, and uh, you have an FA of zero. If you have an FA can approach one, if the eigenvalue in one direction is much larger, the first direction is much larger than the other directions. We can also look at the general diffusivity within a voxel, and that's called the mean diffusivity. That this will just be the average of all of our eigenvalues. And we can look at it just on the second and third one, and that gives us a, a measure of how, how uh, uh, the, the ratio of those two, the relationship of those two remaining eigenvalues. So all of these are used in the literature. Um, we will talk about a little of that. Okay, so gray matter. Gray matter is not as organized as white matter in terms of the, uh, the uh, myelination. The fibers are going generally together in many places in the brain, which leads to the fractional anisotropy being higher. 
in, in uh, white matter. We have uh, bundles of fibers together will be more unified in, within a voxel, and so that will also contribute to fractional anisotropy. The observed fractional anisotropy for that voxel will be, will be higher, too. If we have more of them within a vo voxel, more white matter uh, bundles, fibers, then we can get, also see an increase in fractional anisotropy. And this will also vary with the myelination of, of the subjects. So younger subjects have different myelination. Or if you're looking at problems of myelination, you can see differences there in fractional anisotropy. And this is what some of these images look like. Um, generally, what we use is a, a fractional anisotropy of at least 0.2 as a, a proxy for white matter. This is a map of a fractional anisotropy. Um, and if we just mask at 0.2, we can see that it, it follows the white matter contours. Well, mean diffusivity is, is uh, throughout, and it's, it's uh, generally higher in the gray matter and in the ventricles. What we do in the MRI uh, uh, scanner is we impose a gradient field, and we see how the, uh, the tissue responds to that responds to that in the MRI signal. And we, it's, it follows the, what's the, uh, called the Stiskal tanner equation. So the signal is, is proportional to the, the signal without the, uh, the, uh, the gradient at, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, the diffusivity of that, that, that diffusion tensor is uh, going to change our signal there. So what we're trying to find is this D here. We're going to try to find that tensor. We're going to solve this for the diffusion tensor. OK, and this, this is what the images look like. A B equals 0 a image. This is without an, any additional gradient. It looks like this. And so we'll acquire some of these. And then we impose the gradient in different directions. We impose it on lots of different directions. We're trying to solve um, for six, uh, for six uh, uh, elements of that diffusion tensor matrix. So we need at least six. And, and generally, we'll have many, many more. We would have 30, 40. Or if you're doing Hardy, you could have 200 or, or even more of those. All of these take longer to acquire, so you, you have to account for that. Um, but uh, you can, uh, this, uh, and in each gradient it changes the image in these kinds of ways. But by using those, those dif different values, we can solve this equation. And we'll solve it generally with, uh, we use an additive noise model. So um, we can solve it linearly, or we can solve it nonlinearly, taking, taking into account this noise. And if you don't account for the, the noise, uh, 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 we can, you'll get differences in rotations and rescaling. The, uh, any, all the noise in it can contribute to mistakes in these, these, uh, the values that we get out of the ellipsoid. DWI has a lot of distortions in it. We saw the distortions, just, you know, just the image by itself looks in a way distorted. But we can also have the regular things that we see in fMRI, the subject motion. We have eddy current distortions from the, the switching of the gradients. We have uh, uh, EPI distortion, the same kind of thing we saw uh, for, with uh, fMRI data that, uh, that we saw with blip up, blip down. We can do the same kinds of things here. And all these things combined. So we need a processing method that takes into account all these different problems. Here is uh, what motion looks like in, in diffusion-weighted images. So you have interleaved brightness. So it may look fine within plane, but uh, outside the plane, you'll have this kind of striping pattern. OK, and like, the, like what we saw with the blip up, blip down uh, on, on uh, uh, in fMRI, we have that same kind of thing of signal pileup and the attenuation, so it could be larger or smaller in one direction than another. And so we have some 
some things like this here. And so we can, we can handle that in a similar way. That is, you know, generally this is what we're, we're going with AFNI. You could solve these kinds of things with 3D DWI to DT to, to get your, your uh, tensor. You can also use a package called Tortoise, which is also made, at, developed at NIH by Carlo Pierpaoli's group with Okan Fogolo. And um, uh, we will show you some examples with that. So that's kind of the, the basic introduction to diffusion tensor imaging. Any questions on that? Okay, there'll be like three sections to, to this part. Yes? The large, the large distortion. Can the nonlinear, um, can the uh, larger distortions be accounted for by nonlinear right. registration? Yes, yeah, so that's in fact what we do in the same way that we, well, pretty similar way that we do it in, with uh, the fMRI, while matching the blip up and blip down. But it requires that to be part of your acquisition to, to do that, that correction. In, uh, in uh, this is done in Tortoise, not in our package, but in, the, in our kind of sister package. The, uh, uh, the, it's done with the, with the part called Dr. Buddy. So Dr. Buddy does that blip up distortion correction. Every uh, gradient has, is done in both directions. FATCAT 2, DTI tracking intro. So we're going to talk about tractography now. All right, it's tractography. Okay, so we're going to use tractography. We're going to uh, talk about motivations, why we want to do it, how it works, and, uh, and use it in combination of gray matter and white matter and think, think about the interpretation a bit. Okay, this is a neuron. We have the axon. We are basically trying to, mo to model this myelin sheath. Water flows through the myelin in, in, in a direction. That's what this technique is, is, uh, is based around. And we're not doing it on one neuron. We're doing it on lots and lots of neurons together, into, uh, organized into bundles. We've got a lot of, of a lot of pieces of axon, a lot of axons all together within an within a voxel. Okay, we've seen the the F fractional anisotropy and the mean diffusivity. Okay. So before to see white matter, you'd have to extract the whole brain, and uh, and uh, and uh, go through a lot of. Uh, uh, histology uh, checks there and uh, it's it's fairly invasive and nobody will agree to do this so hopefully we're trying to get to the point where we see really clear tractography like this okay so we we start off with all these ellipsoids that we talked about before and we're going to link these ellipsoids together like sausages this was this presentation was written by Paul Taylor who's from Wisconsin and it's a thing there so, <laughs> okay, so we connect our ellipsoids together and we have linked structures. Okay, so I like to say that, uh, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to know how, uh, how sausages are made, how laws are made, and, and tractography, really. So uh, these are kind of behind the scenes. How do, they, how do we come together? How do we get these tracks to get them? To, to happen. Okay. In the end, we can come up, this is one form of tractography. This is a view from head on over here. Here's looking at you, and here's looking downward um, over the top of the head. Uh, the, this method produces lots of pretty pictures. And you can, you, like Instacore, maybe even more so, you could spend all day playing around with the interfaces and and looking for these beautiful fibers. Uh, usually we're doing this, okay, so groups are done in the end at region levels, generally. So you're going to do, take your results at, 
uh, four regions from tables of region connectivities uh, and then compare those, but not, not so much at the, at, at the voxel level. That's your question, right? And mostly we're going to do this in the native subject space. We don't really go to the standard space. We're going to move everything into the, uh, into the native space, including atlases, free surfer segmentation and that kind of thing. So this is a diagram of how tractography works. You've got your ellipsoid at every voxel, and then you make a map of all the ellipsoids. You start at some, you use some sort of algorithm to connect the, uh, the, uh, the voxels together, and then you come up with a map that looks like this. And there have been lots and lots and lots of methods. Um, they work in varying degrees. Paul Taylor came up with, with uh, one here. Um, so the, there are lots of different methods because none of them solve everything. And even histology can't give us the answers because histology is destructive and you still can't see all the fibers fantastically well and then connect them to each other. We do have some test models. I will show you a little bit of that. Okay, so one algorithm that's been in use for a long time is one is called FACT, Fiber Assessment by Continuous Tracking, developed by Susumu Mori at Hopkins in 1999. It's been used many times. This is an old slide. It's been used many more times than that. And uh, um, this is generally how it works. You take, to use, at every voxel, you look at the ellipsoid directions, and then you go from one voxel to the next, and it, that, the next voxel, you take that direction. It's simple, and it, it roughly works. But you know, you'll notice some, there can be some problems. So if you get, if this is going toward the corner, but it happens to land on this side, it will go like that. If it happens to land on that side, it goes up. So you could miss the, the voxel that it seems to be pointing at completely because it's, it's, uh, it's really kind of based on every voxel that it goes to, it switches its direction dramatically. So how can we improve it? Uh, Paul came up with fact ID. And basically what he does is he cuts off the corners on all the voxels. If it, it reaches a corner in, any dim, in all dimensions, and this is what it looks like in 3D, then he continues on to the diagonal voxel. This leads to a big improvement in the, uh, in the uh, tractography. Okay, so you can you know, look, some, look at something like what we looked at before, so if you take these, uh, these uh, example vectors, you put one like this, one like this, if the green one will continue through, the blue one also, it continues through, but to the, the next voxel, so you just compute the path that way. So it bends, it has some more bending capability in there. Okay, so fact ID ends up having 26 neighbors of voxels, and fact has six neighbors. Gives you more possibilities to turn around. Okay, so fact ID, if you, if you uh, rotate the axes, and these are rotated in the scanner, not in, in the data set, they're, they're new acquisitions rotated, uh, you can see that the fact ID will be more or less consistent. In fact, because it's six voxel neighbors, will give you different results uh, every time. It's also because it does this, it's, a, it's more robust to noise. So if we, if we have added noise onto it, then uh, the original data will look similar to, to even add, adding a lot more noise onto it. But fact um, is, is a lot more sensitive on that. This is a phantom that somebody developed in 2011. Villard developed that, and he tested various algorithms on it. Uh, we tried we tried it on this one, and it it does a fairly decent job. You can see that in some places where fibers, uh, this is just 
uh, a phantom that they that uh, with a gel in it that that's uh, in tubes, and so they they know what the right answer is. This is the right answer. How close to that right answer can you get? So it's not it's not like a real brain, of course, but it's it's a quick test. And so we still can't go through where where fibers are crossing or fibers are kissing because we can't tell the difference uh, whether they turn around or go through. And so that's that's the problem. Or they can just stop there. We do a better job than fact, but it's still it's not it's not perfect. Okay, so Charles Babbage uh, quote, okay, if you give a machine the wrong figures, will the right answers come out? And this happens in imaging too. It says if you give it bad data, do you, can you get good data out of it? Well, mostly you can't, right? So we have to make sure our data is good and, uh, and, and, and take care of our data as much as possible, looking for problems. Um, so data acquisition, preparation matter a lot. Okay, so generally we recommend using the tortoise package. So what happens is if you don't process your data and you just do your tensor acquisition, you will end up something with something like this as your, your fibers. Um, it's the same, this is a, a side view. So, uh, and so you, if you process with tortoise instead you get something like this. So instead of a, but to me it's like a sick cricket, you end up with a pretty hummingbird or something like that. Okay. Um, all right, so we can do tractography through the whole brain using that algorithm. Uh, at every, we, we go to every white voxel. We'll st we start at fractional anisotropy of a cert at least 0.2, and we'll end when, when the voxels are, are uh, uh, at least 0.2 also, and we look for bending of a certain amount too. And, uh, and they have to be at least some length, because every voxel has a some, some length, and we'll also overseed. We'll do more than one voxel, more than one track per, per voxel. We can add on to that, say we want to have, have uh, tracks that go from one region to another region, uh, and, or we can have, so that, we, or we can have, that would be and logic, we can have uh, tracks that go between either, either regions, that would be or logic, and, and remove all the other, other tracks. We can take groups of uh, ROIs and look to see how they're connected together but through the white matter. So here, the ROIs are, are generated uh, uh, through, through a functional connectivity measure, like uh, resting state correlation or something like that. Or we can generate these by uh, uh, clusters of activation in a task-based uh, study. So that's the same thing. Get, where do you get your targets? You get it from fMRI. You can get it from free surfer parcellation, any kind of parcellation, or you can get it from spheres across uh, a data set where you, you've set them up. And here, this is around the corpus callosum. We're, we're looking at target regions, and we have networks of targets that we can put together in different, in different kinds of logic. Tracts are the, uh, the each one of those, those fibers, we call those tracts. Uh, groups of tracts together, we'll call those bundles. And uh, if there's a connection uh, between uh, uh, two regions, uh, well, that's, uh, well, that'll be our white matter connection. And we can average quantities across that, that whole group of connections. And we have the network, all the white matter regions we've got together. Okay, so here is a, what we will call a, a structural connectivity matrix. So like the resting state uh, data, we can calculate a, uh, a matrix of uh, connections between regions. So there's region one, two, all the other regions. And so let's say region, uh, 
6 and region 8 are connected very strongly here with an FA, an average FA of 0.6. And you'll notice that rather than, as opposed to correlation, we have that uh, value of 1 along the diagonals, these are the average FA on, for that region. And you see there are also a lot of empty spots. We don't have to have a connection at all, and so those are just, we'll just leave those as zeros. This is the similar functional connectivity matrix. So you can look at these and compare how similar uh, or different functional fractional anisotropy is from the, the functional connectivity matrix. Here's some examples. Uh, we have a, a gray matter network. So these gray matter ROIs are, are gotten from the literature, from Neurosynth, uh, from your own experiment. And then we'll use those as our seed regions to see how, uh, how connected they are uh, with, with diffusion tensor imaging. Okay, so the beauty and the beast, the belle et la bête of tractography. Okay, so we're, we're, we see lots of beautiful images but we're looking at data, the, the axons are only a few microns. We've got voxel size that are generally in the order of millimeters. We're trying to resolve a problem that's a, you know, a different scale. So um, here, this is something from iWire, uh, trying to, to, to look at directions of axons altogether is hard. You know, they have that, that, uh, um, that uh, project where they have people figuring this out one as a um, community, I forget what that's called. It's, uh, yeah, no, the IY, what's the, what's the word for that? The group? Hmm? Crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing, that's the word, I just lost it there. All right, yeah. So we don't do crowdsourcing, and this data, we'll just try to figure it out as best as we can. Oops. Um, so we have... And we have the other problem of the fibers that cross or kiss. This is the, the crossing fiber. This is the kissing fiber. It's very difficult to tell with our data uh, what, which one it is. So fibers come together and apart in groups. And do they go across or do they turn around? All right. We do have post-mortem data that we can use to verify some of these things. And we see that some fibers do exist. Uh, we're able to reprodu reproduce many of the known pathways, but there are problems. We find false, false positives, and we have false negatives. So sometimes we don't see the connections. OK, but we do know that gray matter is connected by white matter. Let's see what we can find to, that connects them and see if it makes sense in combination with our, 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 our connectivity data. So that was the second part, the tractography. Any questions about that? OK. So yeah, we'll get to kind of more, more tractography. We have three kinds, so we'll talk about that. All right. OK, so. Um, yeah, so we have different kinds of tractography. Um, okay, so we're trying to look at our at networks. And we've got some uh, fMRI data, some parcellation. You've seen these. Um, so we're not going to a standard space. We're doing everything in its, in its, uh, in its local space. And we're going to try to combine our functional connectivity with, with the structural connectivity. And this is a diagram of how these kind of go together. This is actually an old diagram. I'll show you the new diagram in a little bit, but we'll keep going here because, uh, just to see how the tractography works. OK, so we've got networks of gray matter. This is uh, from an ICA analysis. 
and uh, we can quantify various things about the gray matter and put those together. So we have correlation, that, that kind of thing that you've just, that I just showed you. And uh, we'll use these as seed regions. And this is what it looks like in SUMA. You can take those, those uh, white matter regions, those uh, gray matter regions, use them as seed regions in SUMA. That in another session, um, how to do that for any kind of region. And, uh, this, and we'll look to see if we, what, we can con what connects to what. Okay, so we have tractography. This is the first one, uh, the simplest case of de deterministic tractography. We're just looking uh, at, at the, the simple fact ID and just as the data as it is. And so we'll look to see how, whether one, one um, voxel or one seed point connects to another. We, we overseed it so we can get this. The deterministic tractography gives you results like this. You can make surfaces out of it with SUMA and show it there, and it looks like that. Um, it's okay for quick testing. We, yeah, it's, it's also fun to look at. You can do the exploring with, uh, with this, um, but it's going, to be a lot of, it's going to have a lot of dependence on noise in your data. We're going to try to, sol to, to handle the noise through two other kinds of tractography methods. Okay, one is called mini-probabilistic tractography. So here, we're going to repeat our tractography uh, about seven times. So we're going to repeat it, the deterministic one, seven times, but each time we're going to add some noise onto it, noise that we, we see in our data. We're going to perturb it a bit, randomly do the tractography again, and see if we end, if we end up with those tracts. And uh, here's an example here. You get somewhat bigger tracts because you've done it many times, but if you see only a fiber by itself like that, then you don't trust that as much because it only showed up in that one case. If you've done it seven times, you should see seven of them. This is still relatively fast, uh, but it's not interactive uh, in, as in track, the diffusion tensor in the, um, in the deterministic tractography. And then you have full probabilistic tracking. So in the full probabilistic tracking, we'll repeat this thousands and thousands of times, uh, just in the same way that we did in the mini prob. But in this case, we don't see those thousands of fibers. We're just going to say, based on some threshold, that is this voxel included in, in, our, in our end connect, connection? So is it still there? Still there, we'll, we'll keep it as part of that connection. And that's generally what we recommend for your, your final analysis, uh, to use the probabilistic uh, uh, tracking. You will have these kinds of surfaces. Uh, you get kinds of similar things that are the deterministic and the mini probabilistic, but uh, uh, this is probably the way to go. And in here, these are the regions that we used as our seed regions here. Besides the, uh, the pretty pictures and, and surfaces, we generate these, these uh, these uh, matrices, and the matrices include, uh, are, uh, they come from these uh, tables. The tables are in text files. You can use them as, as text files or as tables, uh, as uh, graph images. So we, pr we produce things for you. You can go through a couple different choices here, uh, depending on which one you're doing, the deterministic, the mini-probabilistic, or the probabilistic. Okay, and this is all done by a program, well, most of it's done by a program called 3D Track ID. This is the program that Paul wrote to go between regions. It's actually, um, it actually calculates all the regions in the whole brain at once, and it takes, uh, it's only a few seconds for a whole brain tractography. And then these are applied after, afterwards to see the, 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 how the ROIs interact with those tracts. So we can do this very, very fast. This is undeterministic, but we can repeat this many times. And, uh, 
but before, uh, when you we use the deterministic tractography uh, in the uh, in the the part of the the uh, quality control for doing uh, gradient flipping. And uh, I think the first time I ran into it was with Christina, so, uh, that we had the wrong sequence and the wrong directions and things didn't connect. And so we end up with things like this or things like this or things like this. And so we have this program uh, at grad flip test that will flip the ones in different ways and see sees which one is which ones are, are right. In that case with Christina, we had a whole new, we had the directions completely wrong. And it's surprising how good the results can still look, even when the directions are completely wrong, but they look a lot better when they're right. So, <laughs> so we provide tools like this to, to automatically detect the gradient format and, uh, and say that Okay, we're gonna we're gonna flip in the Y. Usually, that's the case. We flip in the Y. Um, there is no standard. That's why we have to flip it. So we can't. So there's X, Y, and Z in the for the gradient directions, and we have to say which direction they are. And so. Okay. All right. So one of the things that we have to do is we use 3D ROI Maker. The, re the, the regions, the, uh, the gray matter regions, are just some, they're very often a little bit too small. We need them to be slightly bigger, but not go into the white matter. So we use 3D ROI Maker to inflate them a little bit and not go into FA values of 0.2 or more. And that was subtle, but that's the difference. It's generally just a voxel to go to. to to get to the point two. So we're inflating our gray matter to, to, to the point two value and not into it. Um, here's some from fMRI. Okay, some clusters that we have there. And there we're also going to inflate those. There are other things that, that our worker can do. Um, you can remove different uh, parts of it, you can have um, just the the highest values uh, uh, of uh, some some data set, so you can use that as a, a thresholding there, um, and you can provide a reference set to get consistent numbering across your your subject. So, if, uh, so if you always want it to be one, two, three, four for these regions over there and there, so you can. You can have it automatically find your mat the matching set. Okay, so this is a description of how we we uh, calculate uncertainty. What we're going to do is we're going to take some of our gradients and recalculate the tensor. And so here we got we've got just twelve gradients. We'll take nine of them uh, and. Uh, Calculate our tensor. We'll do this thousands and thousands of times, and then we get a distribution. From that distribution, we will have an estimation of of how sensitive our vector is. So our first eigenvector is going to determine the direction of our our tracts, and so we can apply that to to our our data set, to our tractography, and see. If it if it makes it and the FA value is another, we will see that the, both the the FA and the eigenvector will are affected by this. Okay, so this is the map of the bias, the standard deviation of the eigenvectors, and the FA. So uh, that's what gets fed into the uncertainty. Okay, we can do this for Hardy images too. This is these are. These are um, data sets that are modeled. The diffusion tensor is, uh, is calculated with uh, multiple uh, ellipsoid kinds of uh, shapes that will give us the direction in different, different ways. So that's it in one, two, three, four ways. So you can, you can get higher order of directions.
And so Fat Cat can take care of that too. Now we don't do hardy tensor estimation. Uh, we, we, uh, this is either from DSI Studio or Diffusion Toolkit, and I think uh, MR Tricks also uh, does this too. Um, okay, and this is what it looks like. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's pretty nice. Uh, it's probably better, but it does take up a lot more time. So Fat Cat can also do the connectome type of tracking. Uh, this is where you give it parcellation. This is parcellation from FreeSurfer, and here we use ROI Maker to inflate the uh, the regions up up to that FA of 0.2. And then we're going to keep the label tables in it and uh, then the, do the tractography. And this you call 3D track ID with these as your seed regions. And voila, you get connectome tracking. So all the regions are colored by those, all the uh, fibers are colored by the regions. So that ends that um, part of this uh, presentation.